We're recording. All right. Welcome everyone to today's informative Friday presentation. Uh, today's topic is the introduction to file creation utility. Uh, our presenters today will be John Gustafson, Rob Velasco, and Jared Brock. Uh, before we get started, if you're not familiar with Bales, I'd like to take a few seconds to tell you a little bit about us. We've been in the Infor ecosystem for over 26 years. We're entirely focused on the Infor platform. Uh, we do nothing but Infor implementations, upgrades, and managed services. We support all aspects of the technology, including S3, Landmark, and Cloud Suite. Um, our, the suites that we specialize in are human capital management, finance, and supply chain management. Um, in fact, we've been recognized and given partnering awards in eight out of the last 10 years. Our consultants bring 15 plus years of consulting experience in this space and equivalent in professional experience. Some are former benefits managers, compensation managers, directors of supply chain, as well as former controllers and CFOs. Uh, we're highly ranked um, in class, which is an industry, health, a healthcare leading industry um, organization that ranks um, ERP vendors um, in their ability to implement and perform the, the implementation service work. Um, exciting news for the Infor community. Earlier this year, Bales became a part of, part of Nordic Consulting. Um, they're an industry leading healthcare consulting firm. We still operate as Bales and Associates as a wholly owned subsidiary and continue to be led by Jamie Bales, our president. Nordic will provide us with resources to fund our growth, expand our business, and support our customers more effectively. For healthcare customers, it allows us to bring together the Nordic's, Nordic's capabilities in the EHR space to provide a more holistic solution, including specific expertise in EHR and ERP integration. This combination will offer a best practice model to reduce implementation risk and leverage the data from both systems to drive insights and out outcomes. Again, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, and let me go ahead and turn it over to John Gustafson. All right, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, so introductions, uh, that is obviously not a picture of me, but that is a picture of our adorable new member of our family, Minnie, who is a rescue that we had just rescued about two weeks ago. And uh, I didn't have a good picture of myself, so I just thought I would put a picture of Minnie on the screen for us. So my name is John Gustafson. I've been in the uh, Lawson Infor space for 23 years. So if there were, uh, if you do see on the video camera, I do have plenty of gray hair from all the years, both because of my age and from many years of doing projects and, and all the fun that comes from that. So I've worked for Infor as well as uh, a number of customers and partners. Uh, currently at Bales, I am a principal consultant I'm working as a technical project manager, as well as doing a lot of implementation work and development work. So I'm very excited to share this information with all of you as uh, I think the file creation utility is something that's been around for a while, but uh, a lot of people don't know a whole lot about it and the power that that tool really has for us. Quick disclaimer here, uh, I'm not gonna read through all of this disclaimer, but basically information provided here is related to Infor version 11 Cloud Suite. This information is for presentation and general information purposes only. You should not solely rely on this material. Uh, I did not put a slide on here and I had forgotten to do that, but a lot of the information for this presentation came directly from the um, docs.info.com website. And if you go into the people section and go into the human talent, in there and search for file creation utility is where you will see a lot of the information that this was based off of. So I would definitely go there for um, all of your information, especially since that will be updated as, as time goes on. And it is also recommended that you contact Bales and Associates to make sure that your solutions are tailored specifically to the needs that you may have. The file creation utility. So basically this is a delivered utility uh, inside of Infor Global HR. So this is not available for the finance supply chain business. It is solely for Infor Global HR. It is for multi-tenant or single tenant. I do not uh, recall the exact customer update that introduced this, but it's been around for quite a while. So if you are a single tenant Cloud Suite client, most likely you do have this available to you as well. The file creation utility or FCU allows for the creation of flat files based on mappings to specific data. 
The generated files can then be used for exports, which is typically what it is used for. And so there are a list of files from Infor that they have made available for the file creation utility. And a lot of them are your employee demographic benefits, some payroll information, and they are consistently adding to this list. So if this is something that looks like a tool that you'd like to use and you want to grab some data from the Infor Global HR application, but you do not see the business classes that you would really like to be able to access, open up a, a request with Infor and ask them to consider including that in one of the customer updates. And they're generally pretty good at including whatever customers want. They've done a really good job of including a lot of very good information, but if there is anything missing, you can definitely uh, reach out to them and ask them to include that in the next customer update. Uh, these files can be quickly and easily created without any coding and you'll see that in some of the slides here of what we have it's very easy uh, your hris department could definitely do this your power users could definitely use this tool you would not have to rely on your it development team you would not have to rely on infor process automation it's really a, a tool that's very simple to use if you understand some of the data structures inside of Infor Global HR. So it's something that really a lot of power users, non-IT developers could definitely use. And then the really cool thing is so when you run this, generate the file, it creates the file for you and that you can then download onto your computer. But if you want to use this as an export and schedule it and have it automatically send the file somewhere, there is the ability to link these files coming out of the file creation utility to a process flow or to ION. And I do have a screenshot in here to show where you would set that up. So we'll go over that in a little more detail when we get to that, that part of this presentation. As far as accessing the file creation utility, there's a couple of ways to do it. The old way, which I don't have a screenshot for, but you would go into the admin, um, administration console, go into your configurations, utilities, uh, integrations and then go down to file creation utility about six months ago Infor brought in a new menu a new group called integration architect which makes it so much easier to find it so truly all that you have to do is you go into the integration architect and then one of your options from that will be the file creation utility and then from there you would click on your dashboard to see the list of all of the uh, creations that have been made as well as the opportunity to build a new one from there There are four main components to the file creation utility. We have eligibility groups. So anybody that is on here that is familiar with Infor Global HR probably knows a little bit about eligibility groups, but basically what these are is this is what you would use to limit what records will be included in the file. So this is really gonna be your filter. You, you build in, in the eligibility groups how you want to limit who is going to be included in this file. We then have rows. And so your rows can be a header row, a trailer row, and multiple detail rows. And I've got a, a really good example here that I'm gonna go through with all of you that, that's showing that information and how we can have multiple rows of details for files if that's what we want. And then of course, this doesn't do us any good if we don't have columns. So then we have, that's the third component. And so this is where we will tell the system what kind of data do we wanna put in this row? And it could be a literal value it could be information from a business class field. The power of this tool is you can bring in your user fields. So any user fields that you have created, if as long as they're attached to one of the business classes that are listed, you can bring that user field into this report, which really expands the possibilities of being able to get the data out of your system and create files with this tool. And then you can create blank. And I'll show that in our example of why in the world would you wanna have a blank value in one of your columns. And I'll show you how, why you would do that and how you could do that. And then the fourth component, which is another very powerful component is gonna be your data mappings. So this is where you're gonna remap the values from the infor value to any other value. And we'll show in, in the examples that I have with dependent type relationship. You know, Instead of it being spouse, child, son, daughter, whatever you have like that, you can actually set up these mappings because maybe your vendor needs it to be a one, two, three, or a four. And so you can set up those data mappings and really without this possibility of doing data mappings, this tool wouldn't be very powerful because usually the data 
in Infor isn't exactly the way that you need it in the system. And so really what this data mappings capability allows you to do is as long as you don't need a whole lot of logic built into it, as long as you don't need JavaScripting language to figure out how to do this, if it's as simple as if in for it equals A, map it to B, you can then use this component of file creation utility to really expand the possibilities of what you can do with this tool. And so I've got, we'll look at the data mappings as well. Eligibility groups. So basically when, when you go in to create your, your new file creation, one of the very first things that you have to do is you have to tell it which eligibility group you want to use. And so as I had mentioned, the eligibility group is what's going to tell the system what kind of records do we want included in here. So you're going to come up here and you're going to give it a name, whatever you want your custom group to be, <clears throat> excuse me, to be named along with an effective date. By default, this will be set as active, but you can always come in here and inactivate it if it's one that you're not using. One gotcha is this business class field. It says work assignment, and this is grayed out and you are not able to select this field. This uh, Infor would maybe get mad at me if, if they knew that I was calling this a bug, but this is, I'm not sure why that is there. It, it is stuck there, but really you don't need this business class at all because what you're going to do is you're going to build your condition down here in the condition box. And this is where you're going to tell the system what, what are the rules? What are the conditions of the, of the records that I want? You may worry, oh no, I don't know how to build conditions. The beauty is we do, they do have a builder, which is very nice. You click on this. On the left side, you select your field name, and it does just like everything else inside of, inside of the, the new Infor product. You can go ahead and you can go down the directory structure. So if you know it's an employee, you select the employee business class, and then you go through find relationship status. The, the next section is, what are we doing to compare this? Is it equal to, not equal to, greater than, one of? There's a bunch of different conditions that you can select. And then the equals to, you can select literal and type in what the literal values are going to be, in this case, active. But you could even build into this condition where one field is equal to or greater than another field. So you may want to be comparing dates in here as part of your condition. So an example would be uh, maybe their hire date is greater than a certain date. So this is where you can really build your conditions however you want. So really, if you can logically determine what records you want included in this file, you can then build those in here into the conditions. And so this is something that really will be helpful. And you can go ahead and click on the builder to help you do it. Once you do a few of these, you can always just type it right in here what you want for that condition. The tricky part here next is you have to hit save after you create this custom group, then the custom group subjects shows up on the bottom. And this is a very important component. So this is the part where then you're going to go in, you're going to click the create icon, and you're going to see all the different subjects that are in the system, and there's hundreds of them. What you're going to look for is any of the subjects that start with HCM group file creation. That's going to be the preference prefix of what you're going to need. So then the next one is going to be whatever the business class you are using. So if I did not select this, in this case, we're building off of the employee business class. If I did not select this specific subject, when I go to, to select an eligibility group, I would not see this John Active EE showing up because it is not connected to, it's not tied to the employee business class. So this is a very important step that a lot of people miss. They hit save and then they move on and then they can't find it. It's not in their list. So then you have to come back in. Then you realize this custom group subjects is on the bottom and it's empty. So this is a very important component of it. And this doesn't show up until you hit save. Then you can come down here. So if we were building an eligibility group or if we were building a report based off of work assignment, if that was really going to be our core business group, uh, business class, we would select the subject of HCM group file creation work assignment. And so you'll see that, and you'll see all of those subjects. So once I have all of this set up, I'm then going to go ahead and select this as my eligibility group. This is now gonna tell the system in this example here, any employee in the system who has a relationship status of active is going to be included. So this is obviously a very basic 
example, but it can get a lot more complicated if you need. Once you've assigned that, it then opens up the ability to create your row details. So your rows, if you're familiar with, with any kind of a export, any kind of a CSV file, your rows are the individual rows of data that are going to be in the system. And so this is where we can go in, and if you need a header row, we can go ahead and create the, the very first row is going to be a header, and that's one of your options is going to be row type. And so you would select header, and then that's all that you need. So you're telling the system here, the very first row of this file is simply going to be a header row. And you'll see um, in the next screen here how you tell it what kind of values you want in that header row. Next in my example, my second row I've got, I'm naming it employee. And it's coming from the source file, which is the employee business class. So my second row is going to be employee information. Then one of the really cool features that are part of this is my third row here is going to be dependent. And that's going to be a one to many. So I could have multiple dependents. I could have zero dependents. But for this report that I'm wanting to create, I want to go ahead and show information from the dependents as well. So I set this up as a one to many. That's one of my options that I can select. And then it will show me a drop down of all of the one to many relationships that are built into the system. So I select from that screen dependent and then go ahead and set that up this way. So this is how I can set up my rows so that I've got my header row and then it's going to give me any employee information. And then if I have dependents, it's going to give me all of the dependent information and it'll give me one for every one because this is a one to many relationship. After you create your rows, we now have to create our columns. We have to tell the system what kind of information are we going to be putting into each one of these rows. So I'm going to select header. And then for my, in this really simple example, we're simply having four columns, employee number, dependent type, first name and last name. That, that's all I've got going on here. Real simple. So what I do when I set up these columns is since this is a header, these are literal. I'm not pulling in data from the system. I'm, I literal, literally want these values to be in each of these fields. And so I tell it what I want, the, want it to be. In this case, employee number, dependent type, first name, and last name. So the header row is super easy. I'm just telling it what values do I want literally to be in each of those fields. After my header row, I've got my employee row. So this is now where I'm telling the system for each of these four, now best practice would be you're going to be using the exact same four field names, or the exact same four columns, just because that way things are going, to, are going to be easier to look at and read. You may have a scenario where um, the requirements are something separate, and so you could do that if you wanted. Just because these are my four columns in the header does not mean they have to be my four columns in my detail rows. But in my example, that's what I've got set up here. So I go in, I, I click on the Create icon, and I tell it my first row is employee number. What's the data type going to be? Well, I know that it's it's a numeric data type. And again, if you don't know the answer to what that data type is or what that source field is, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the control shift left click on any of the fields inside of uh, Mingle and that will then tell you what the name of the field is as well as what the data type of that field is. So for employee number, it's going to be numeric. For my input option, I've got options of field required, field optional, blank, or literal. So in this example, I'm, I'm saying that this is field required. It, there needs to be an employee number or else this export is going to fail. Any of you that are in Global HR, you obviously know that there would not be a record anyways if there wasn't an employee number. So, But we go ahead and we select field required. It's coming from the employee business class. And this is where if there are any relations, you could select if it's a one-to-one -one relationship, such as employee identification number, you could select that relationship and then bring the field in from there. So if it's a one-to-one -one relationship, you can build that right into the regular row. You don't have to build this separate one-to-many row. And then I tell it what I want the name of the field to be. So in this case, employee. Now, in my example file that I'm creating, my second column is dependent type. Well, this is the employee record. It's not the dependent record. So I don't want a value in here. So this is where I would go in and tell it that the value is going to be blank. So I'm not pulling any data. I'm not putting a literal value in. I just want a blank 
value in, in this column for the employee row. Obviously for the dependent row, we're not gonna be using blank. Then I've got my, my first name and my last name. Again, they're alpha fields, field is required, coming from the employee business class and the name of the fields. So very simply telling the system exactly where you're gonna, where are you gonna find this data for this row? Things get a little more complicated when we get to our third row because this is our one to many. So I select my dependent and here again, well, I made a mistake here. Um, I switched the order of columns three and four. So in the header and an employee, it had employee number, dependent type, first name, last name. In the dependent, I accidentally went last name, first name. So as you can see, the system will let me do that. It'll, it, it's not idiot proof. It's gonna let you make a mistake like this. And obviously, you know, if you ran this report and looked at it, you'd realize, oh, these values are backwards for the dependent. So I apologize about that mistake in here. Um, but the same type of thing. So the very first column is gonna be employee number. Now that's not coming from the dependent business class. That's coming from the employee business class. So when I set that up, I can tell it it's from the employee business class and, and here's the value and it's able to find that because it's related for my next three columns dependent type last name and first name these are all coming from the dependent business class which again is our one to many so i go in and one of the options when i set this up is this field is from the one to many dependent class so the one to many related class so i select that option, no longer can I put in what the source business class is because it knows what it is from up here in the row setup. And then I tell it what the field is. So what this is gonna create for me is, is a nice output where I've got my header row, then I have a row of employee information. And then if I have dependents, I'm gonna have the dependent information and it's gonna show me the employee number, the relationship type, should be first name and then last name. So this is really kind of showing you that you can set up these detailed rows and kind of tell you, show you a couple of the different types of values that you could have. If you had a requirement to have a literal value in one of the columns, maybe it's company number and you only have one company number, rather than pulling that file in from the system, you could create that column, have the input option be literal and then put in what that literal value is gonna be similar to what we did with the header. If you don't need to go look at the system to get the data, if it's always gonna be the exact same value, you might as well set that literal value in rather than having it go into the system to find that data. John, we have a quick question for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question is, if the source file on the setup detail tab is employee export, why wouldn't the business class on the mappings tab be employee export, export instead of employee? So if, yeah, if, if you did use employee export, my expectation would be that it would be the, the business class. So one of the things that you can do when you set these up, you can go after in this example, an employee business class, or you can go after the employee export business class. So if you go after the export business class, it's going to do something a little different towards the end. And, and I'll, I'll share that towards the end of the presentation here. But my expectation would be if you did do the employee export business class, that is then what you would see when you select them in here. So if that's not what you're seeing, um, definitely reach out to me, whoever had that question. And, and I'll, I'll research that for you and find out why it's not behaving that way. Very good question. As I had mentioned, one of the great things that we can do that really makes this a more powerful tool is using the data mapping. And so if I go back a screen here, maybe I don't have it on here. So when, I'm, when I've got my main screen that's showing the setup of this export, one of the buttons is mapping, data mapping. And so what I can do is I can come in here and I can set up the system to tell it for this column, I wanna set up data mapping. And I'm going after, as you can see on the top here, the dependent relationship. And so the dependent relationship field is where I'm gonna set up this data mapping. And the order is very important because it's gonna go through and the very first thing it finds where it matches, that's the value that it's going to use. So if there's a scenario where somebody may fit into more than one category, you need to make sure that your order is correct. But what I set up here is, you know, if the relationship is equal to spouse, 
set that to value 0, 1. Again, domestic partner, 0, 1. Daughter, 0, 2. Son, 0, 2. And then what's nice is you have the ability to set up a default. So rather than having to spell out every possible value that could be there, if there's a way you can take advantage of a default value, you obviously want that to be your very last value that you have in here. If none of these apply, then in this real simple example, it's going to use the default value of 0, 3. And you can see in my last column that I'm saying, yes, this is the default map. So that's really a kind of a neat feature that you can kind of set up that catch all if you want. So if you have a requirement that the data coming out of the system needs to have a value different than what's in the system, you can still use a file creation utility as long as there's a simple mapping like this. Now, what you couldn't do is anything more complicated, like if you had to go do some logic, some additional logic to truly figure out how to map it. If that's a requirement for your export, then you're going to need to use an in for process automation or IPA to do that because then you can build that kind of logic into that. But if it's something that it's a simple mapping like this, then you can definitely go ahead and use the creation utility, which, which is a wonderful feature. So once I have all of this set up, I've got my, my file set the way that I want it. How do I get the data out of it? So once you, you have your everything all set up, as you see here, I've got my active employee information as the name of my export. Here's, here's that mappings that I was telling you before, the link where you could see to get into setting up the data mappings. But once I have everything all set up, here's another gotcha. This is not going to be activated. So you're not going to see these options to generate files until you click on this active button. This will get you the first couple times that you create these. You, you'll, you'll be frustrated trying to figure out why can't I generate my records. You have to come in here. It, it will not activate this until you click this button to make it active. As soon as you activate it, now these options are going to show up on the top. So you would click on generate preview records. And so what this does is it creates the records for the export. Now you've got two options. You can have it just create the preview records and then they're gonna sit in this preview records bucket and they're not going to actually, the file's not gonna be created until you tell it to generate. So if it's something where, you know, maybe you're, you're a little worried that, about the quality of the data that may be coming out or there's some kind of validation that you wanna do, you can go ahead and you can generate the preview records and not have it create the actual file. But once you get to the point where things are looking good and you want it to go ahead and create that, one of your options is to go ahead and create the file right away after you generate the preview record. And that's what I've got here. So as soon as you click on generate preview records, this button will pop up or this screen. If you had multiple organizations, you could select which organization you wanted. If you had multiple versions of this file creation setup, this will show you the latest version of it. You could select an older version if you wanted to. If you're testing it and you want to see what the older version would have shown, you could select that. Here's the option that I had mentioned. If you wanted to generate the file automatically after creating the preview record, you would go ahead and select this box. And then what it's going to do, it's going to create your preview records and then it's going to instantly go ahead and process those records. The other really nice feature here is you can schedule this if you want. So as you're building it and testing it, or if this is just going to be a one-off export, you can go ahead and submit it, run it real time. But if it's something that you're wanting it to maybe run every Monday at you know noon, you could go ahead and you could schedule it just like all other things inside of Infor. Schedule it to run on that whatever that specific schedule is that you want. This would then show up in your My Schedule actions and things like that, so you could see when they're scheduled for. But this is one of the great things that you can go ahead and you can generate the file right away or not. You can run it right now on demand or you can go ahead and schedule it. If you chose to not have the file generated after the preview, let me fly back a couple of screens here, I apologize. You would click here on the preview records and you would see all of the records sitting in preview. So if you chose that you wanted to do this, you wanted to validate them first, you wanted to look at them first, you can come in here and click on the preview records tab and then see all of your preview records. Once you've looked at them and you see, okay, everything looks good, then you would come up here and you would click on the link to generate that file. 
once that happens, you're going to get this option, this form here, which is just simply going to show you again. I can't change the organization here. I can't change what version I want to use. Those options are only available when you're previewing. And I can't change the name of my file. This is all just display. So it's showing me for organization hospital using version one of my file creation setup. It's going to create the John EE information.csv file. And then I submit. As you can see, there's no schedule here. So if this is something that you've tested it and it looks good and you want to schedule it, you're probably going to want to go ahead and have it automatically create the file after the preview. Otherwise, it's going to run on a schedule, but it's not going to actually generate your file until you click on this submit button. So this is if you're choosing not to have it created when you when you do the preview, you come in here and then what it's going to do is it's going to take all the records out of that preview column and it's going to go ahead and process them. And what's really nice is you can look in the all records column and you can see what the value is. So they're going to say not processed or processed. So you can kind of see which records it's it's going through as it's working. Once the file is done, like I had mentioned, it's it's going to be just like any other file that you maybe um, export to CSV file from a list view inside of Infor. You know, it's going to it's going to download it to your desktop, which is great if that's what you want the final destination to be for this. One of the things that you can do when you're setting up your file creation in the file attributes and processing tab down towards the bottom, you can tell it which flow you want it to run. So if you want this file to then be FTP over to a, put into an FTP directory, which is the most common use, you can go ahead and select the file, the IPA flow to do that. You could also have it sent to ION. So if you're taking advantage of ION and you're using ION as an organization, you could go ahead and click this button, this slider, and it's going to go ahead and send this file over to ION. Then you can have whatever your processes are inside of ION, do whatever you want with that. Real quick on the process flow. What I've seen customers do that's worked out really well is let's say you've got a dozen HR file creation utilities and you've got a dozen benefit ones and you want them put into two different directories. So what I've seen customers do is they'll have one process flow rather than create multiple process flows. They'll call the process flow you know, FCU to FTP or something similar to that. And then what you could very easily do is you could set up a variable inside of the start node in that IPA flow called directory. And then you would use an assign node inside of IPA that would look at maybe the first two characters of the name. So if I were doing something like this, maybe I would call my file HR active employee information. Or if it's a benefit file, I'd call it BN life insurance participants, as an example. You would set up that variable to then look at those very those first two characters and then use that as the logic to determine do I go into the HR directory in my Infor SFTP site or my own FTP site, or do I go into the benefit directory? If you can build that kind of logic into that IPA flow, oh, sorry, then um, you can just have that one flow, assign all of your file creation utilities to that flow. And then as soon as that file's created, it's gonna go ahead and kick off that flow and then move that file over to that directory in the FTP site. So really cool functionality that you can have. If you need to do more specific work with that, maybe you want, you could also have it send emails. You could throw some email nodes in there as well. So there's, you know, anything you can do in IPA, you could definitely do here. But this is one thing that really kind of opens up the possibilities of using this instead of IPA as a way to create exports that are going to be sent to vendors that are going to be sent out on a scheduled basis is have your your business users create these exports and then just tell them as part of their instructions include that flow here that the is department has already built that flow and then that'll take care of all of this They'll, they can schedule it to run it'll create the file and it'll go ahead and throw the file out onto the ftp site where you want it to go so really cool functionality that you can have here some of the other things and, and i didn't go over it and i knew i didn't have a whole lot of time to go over all of the details but this is where you can go in and you can tell it, is it a flat file? Is it, you know, space? It's, you know, 
55 characters wide? Is it a separated file? If so, what's that field separator going to be? So I can have it be a pipe or a, a semicolon or a, co or a comma. Those are kind of the three most common. I can limit how many records are included in it if I only want a certain number of records. I can tell it, what do I want? What do I want it to do if there is no output? So if it runs and it doesn't find anything, what do I, what do I want it to do? And then threading, this is a new feature. So you can have it use multiple threads. So if this is one that runs for quite a while, you can actually have it use multiple threads to bring that data back faster for you if you want. Not a real big fan of this because if you start using up too many threads, it could negatively affect other areas. One last thing that I apologize, I forgot to put a screen in here, screenshot in here, but in record selection options, one of the things that you can tell it to do is to bring back all records or only records that have changed, which is another really cool feature, is you can have it set to only bring back records that have changed, and then it knows the last time that it ran. So you can have it just go off of the last time that this export happened, only bring records that have changed since that date and time, or you can hard code it with a date and time if you want. Then you tell it what fields are we looking for, what, what information are we looking for for what changed. And so that's great, especially for benefit extracts. You only want people that have changed or you only want new people that are part of the benefit. You can set that up as an option as well. So a lot of really, really cool functionality that is built into this. And like I had mentioned, the best thing that you can do, and actually I'll, I've got it right here. If you're not familiar already, become familiar with docs.info.com. Extremely powerful. This is all of the documentation now that is in the system. So if you come in here, and as I had mentioned, if you look at, back up a bit here. You come, when you go into docs.info.com, click on people, HR talent, and then you're going to select this Info HR Talent User and Administration Documentation Library. As you can see, th this was just published today, uh, yesterday. So they are constantly updating this. Once you come in here, you could search for File Creation Utility, or I just I know that it's over here in Integrations, Info Integrations using file creation utility. And this is where a lot of the information that I'm presenting is all coming from this right here. So great up, great records, great place to go get that information for looking at a lot more of, of the advanced, the details that, that I didn't go through in here. But this would be a great resource specifically for this. But in general, if you're not familiar with docs.info.com, I would strongly recommend that you, you check that out. Any questions that anybody has? We kind of went through a lot of information here. I tried to keep it as high level as I could, but give you some real level, real world ex uh, examples. But uh, do we have any questions that anybody has? Yep, we have one. Um, okay, I'm not technical, so hopefully I can <laughs> relay this message well. If you have two FCUs, both using employee export, is the system able to keep track of which employee export records you've processed with FCU number one versus FCU number two, essentially having two independent sets of employee exports? Or if you process the employee export records using FCU number one, are they still set to not processed for FCU number two that hasn't run yet? Okay, yep. So so what you're going to see is um, for each of the different file creation utilities, you're going to, for each one, you're going to see different preview records. So your FCU1 and your FCU2 are two different file creation utilities that you've set up. Each one of them are going to have their own batch of preview records. So I may have a bunch that are in the preview records of FCU1, and I go ahead and generate them so they're now processed. If I then run preview records for FCU2, as long as they still meet the criteria of, of what I had in that group, it will bring those records in and they will come in as not processed. So that's something that you're going to have to really look at if you're doing multiple um, file creation utility exports that are kind of doing the same thing. You're, you're going to have to look at that of, okay, why do I want two doing the same thing? 
is this going to potentially cause problems is you know or is it going to work the way that i want it to so and you should be able to so yeah so all of those records they're all specific to that one file creation utility so um, it, the system would definitely keep them separated between the two okay um, and one more, it says, uh, functionally, this seems very similar to replication sets. What are the advantages and disadvantages of FCU versus rep sets? All right, so I, um, I'm not extremely familiar with replication sets, but the really, really funny thing is um, the next screen, which I'll give you a little preview of, the next series, next Friday, we have one on introduction to replication sets. So, um, you, you could watch the session next week as well and find out more about the replication sets. And then maybe um, at that point in time, what I'll do is I'll make sure that I'm on that one as well. So if I'll learn it along with you and then we can, you know, if you want to ask that question again next week, um, I'll, I'll be there to help maybe determine what the dif differences would be between the two. Um, I know that this is going to be a lot simpler. You're not going to have to set up the replication sets to go into the data lake or to go to wherever you want it to go. This is a lot easier tool. I've seen a lot of organizations enable their HRIS people to use this tool. So rather than having to rely on the technical teams. Okay. I think that's all we have. Susie Larry says hi. <laughs> <laughs> I've been around I've been around the Lawson world long enough. I usually know quite a few of the people that are uh, that are in the list. So uh, upcoming sessions. So we do actually have one session right after this, which I believe has to do with ACA reporting. Yes, that's correct. Perfect. All right, my memory's not going on me quite yet. Uh, next Friday, October eighth, we've got the introduction to replication sets at eleven o'clock Eastern. And we have different methods of replenishing inventory items at 1 o'clock Eastern. Following that, on the 15th, we've got an asset management, V10 to V11. And then after that, employee and manager homepage basics. So some really good functional sessions that week. The following week after that would be October 22nd. We have a creating and scheduling reoccurring jobs, report distribution groups, and structure relations. And then the, the final one on the on 29th, we've got continuous performance engagement, check-ins, pulse surveys, and badges, and a financial session, ask me anything. And whoever is hosting that one is very brave. I would never host a session where I say, ask me anything, so. And then our final here, so I, I don't remember if, it, is this me or is this Luke taking these last couple screens? That's yes, Luke. I can take over. Thank you so much, Perfect. John, for, for presenting today. And thank you all to the attendees for joining us. Um, again, John kind of ran through the, the upcoming sessions uh, coming in the next couple weeks. If you would like to register for those, you can either email molly.velasco at balesllc.com, and she can assist you with getting registered, or you can visit our website. Um, John, if you want to go to the next slide there. Um, just as a closing thought, everyone, we wanted to make you aware that we're still doing our Coffee with Consultants offering. If you have any questions about what you saw today or any questions related to the Infor products, please reach out to us via our website or Molly. Uh, we will connect you with a consultant who will spend a half hour with you at no charge over coffee, tea, or whatever your be preferred beverage is. Uh, and they'll be happy to answer any questions you have related to the Infor systems. So. Thank you again for attending and we'll see you real soon. And thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, John. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.